Hey, before I kick off the podcast, I just want to shout out Nextdoor Clothing. Nextdoor, uh, a clothing brand based out of Bondi in Sydney. They're making really nice jeans and shirts and hats. So go and check out their full range at nextdoorsydney.com. They're also artists, so you can go and check out a range of art. They put on rad parties, and I love what they're doing. So nextdoorsydney.com for the full range. I'm having a good time. You are? Yeah. I can tell. And we are all in Terrible happy talks. Terrible happy talks. Terrible happy talks. Terrible happy talks. Rock and roll and <laughs> today's guest is Athron. Athron is an Australian musician who lives and works internationally. He has carved out a niche market for himself in Bali in which he works in a full time capacity. Athron divides his time between playing gigs and writing new music with his friends and peers. Just recently, he put himself through a self-imposed creative boot camp by writing and recording 22 songs in 22 days, which included film clips to go with each song. Combined with social media sharing, it's safe to say that Athron is one of the hardest working musos in Bali. Aside from his strong work ethic, Athron is what I would describe as an approachable, accessible and friendly rock star, making him much loved by his fans <laughs> and the Balinese community. Today, Athron is with me to talk about his journey, his discovery of his passion, his creative processes, challenges and hopes for the future. Plus, it's his birthday today. <laughs> Athron, happy birthday, Yo, brother. Thanks, dude. <laughs> Welcome oh. to the house. Welcome to the secret wing of Karabakan Prison. Okay, <laughs> right. How do you feel being so close to the prison? Ah, oh, mate, all good. You know? <laughs> it's, a, it's a nice, gentle nudge of a reminder of what could have been. Mm. <laughs> yeah, it is. Yeah. I it's kind of, it's actually, it's funny when you, when you get so used to something being in your face all the time and then every now and then you stop and reflect on what's really going on. Like just that, you know, I, I pass that prison every day, so... It's always funny to be in a situation where something that is so familiar to you still doesn't, you don't think about it so much. And then every now and then you'll look at it and just go, hang on a second. There's a lot of people going through a lot right now, mm. right there. Mm. Yeah, it's, and it's, you know, it's a beautiful reminder of, of your freedom, I guess, of your own freedom. Yeah, it is. <laughs> is it always good? I often think like, I bet you there's a lot of people in there who are thinking, man, I really wish I didn't do that. Yeah. <laughs> you yeah. know, like... I wish I didn't act on I'm, that impulse. I'm pretty sure that would be the n- one of the the number one thought going through <laughs> everyone said in that place. Mm. Uh, well, or or I wish I wasn't blamed for doing that when I didn't do that. <laughs> that could also be a pretty high percentage in there, I reckon. I reckon. Yeah. So how's your morning been on your birthday, man? Like, what have pretty, you been up to today? Pretty chilled. I crashed at a friend's house after I played at um, Jimbaran Intercon last night. And then went to Manorai. Jim Brown Intercontinental. Intercontinental, yeah. yeah uh, and yeah, crashed at a friend's house, woke up, had a nice breakfast and then cruised back, got myself a massage and uh, decided to, yeah, chilled out morning. Feeling good. Yeah. Is playing like those big sort of five-star resorts been um, a constant for you in Bali? That's pretty, that's definitely been the constant bread and butter. Like that was what allowed me to go full-time with performing as a as my financial <laughs> you know is, is what supplies my financial pocket um which is great i feel really lucky for that and i've i've sort of managed to forge a bunch of weekly residencies that allow me to live here doing that and you know key tusses and all that kind of stuff aren't cheap so you really have to have those residencies in place to even make it worthwhile and to make the balance but um yeah, so they're they're kind of like they're the breadwinners, and then the beauty of that is, you know, it's all about. Usually, it's month to month, so then you can book other shows, and and if festivals come up or gigs overseas, then you can just take that time off and touch and you know get a replacement and touch base when you come back. And knowing now what I know about you know the visa process over here, um, it must be so hard to actually justify that to a, the Indonesian government saying that. Like, do they actually allow you to be here as a musician? Or is this well, something you don't really want to do? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, what's going on, mate? <laughs> um, no, no, you, it is literally a Kitas artist, which is, I see, okay. which is a musician's Kitas. Gotcha. So I'm not pretending to be a carpenter. 
<laughs> and I'm not going to have an, a saw in my back pocket just in case immigration walks in and pretend to be cutting something. But um, no, no, it is literally a musician's key task, but it's definitely not set up for long term. My key, a musician's key task only lasts six months as okay. opposed to everyone else's, which is 12. And it costs the same as everyone else's. So it's basically twice as expensive. And um, yeah, and I think it's set up for come in, do some shows and then and then get out. <laughs> so you've been here, how long have you been here now in Bali? Uh, well, I've not gotten out for 11 years. Not gotten out? <laughs> yeah. Why do you refer to it as not no, gotten no, as out? No, no, I'm just joking. Like as in, as in the key task is set up to come and go. And I haven't really gone, have I? <laughs> I'm still here, which is great. It's all good. Does it feel but like Does it feel like home for you now? Oh, it's definitely home. It's yeah. If there was a home, this is home. Yeah. This is the base. It's it's always. I think anyone that has moved here long term, anyone that I've ever talked to, will always say it's great to get out because there's always things about a small island and and uh, and a place like the chaotic the nature of Bali that where you feel like you've just got to get out to appreciate it um, so that's always part of it but that also pushes you to do more things and expand your lifestyle and your choices and all that kind of stuff so it's good yeah, yeah. so um, after 11 years like I mean does it still have the same magic for you I mean I'm sitting here right now in your bedroom okay and we're looking out over this amazing <laughs> rice paddy field and for me still I still see these rice paddy fields and, you know, beautiful backdrops and sunsets and just go, oh, pinch myself and go, wow. Mm. But I mean, after 11 years, you still get those they get those moments? I, or I absolutely less? do. It's a different magic. It's not the same kind of magic. I mean, I've also been through big stage changes, I guess, in what I'm doing here and how I've lived my life here. So um, when I first moved here, I moved here to run a magazine and I was editor for the Beat magazine. Oh, right. So for the first two years, I was living a very different existence, heavily involved in the night nightlife. Um, and there was a lot at that age, like 11 years ago, at the age and the move and all that kind of stuff and a new place, that was really exciting and it had a different kind of magic. Don't get me wrong, the rice fields were all magic as well, but I was pretty caught up in a hectic out and about lifestyle. Um, and so you go through different stages where you you learn to appreciate different things about Bali. And I think some things do get you know, they do become normal, so you don't appreciate them as much. But there's always something that just grabs your attention every now and then and you go, wow, like this is a pretty special place I'm in and I'm pretty lucky to be here. And definitely, yeah, the the view you've just described to anyone listening and the, the house I'm in, uh, it's taken me a while to live in a place like this and to find a place that I feel really nice and comfortable and creative in. And I, I do feel blessed every time I look out this window. I really do. Mm. Especially having people like yourself drop around and, and see it and go, oh, what a view. And and it's a house that has a lot of musicians coming and going. And we always just, you know, people come here for that reason. And you, think it's, you think they're drawn to it? Yeah, it's a, we sort of, I live with uh, an, a mate of mine who's another musician. Uh, and then a, a good friend of ours, Leah, who lives downstairs. But <clears throat> we've sort of created this house to be really friendly for people to drop around. And because we know so many musicians, it's ended up being a real jam house. So and like you just that view just inspires it. So yeah, I do. Yeah. I real. I do. I re- feel really blessed and lucky. I look out there and just go, man, it's magic. <laughs> just going back yeah. to what you were saying before, um, you know, being a musician and and working in in the in this industry. Um, has it been hard to extricate yourself from the party scene? Or did it really, was it hard to avoid at first? Uh, or have you gone through phases? I've got, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> phases, addictions, you know. <laughs> um, extra, uh, I, mean, I, I, I guess. Because you seem like you've sustained a really um, solid career, you know. And you haven't faded out and you haven't burnt out. And from what I've seen recently you've just produced 22 songs in 22 days <laughs> um you know that would take a lot of stamina and if someone's partying hard they're not they're not doing that oh definitely of. like i there's no way i could have done that five years ago i think yeah the stages for me i i go pretty if i'm into something i go pretty hard like a, probably most of my friends would say too hard into it until i hit a wall and i partied pretty hard and the first number of years i was here i, I definitely wasn't as focused on my own growth as a musician as, as much as I am now. 
and because I was involved in that scene and, and also running that magazine took a lot and, and I was supposed to be in that scene. Yeah, that was part of running the magazine was being deeply entrenched in that scene, knowing all the people in that scene gotcha. and it was fun, but it, it kind of spat me out more than I pulled myself out of it. I mean, more than, yeah, I guess it, I guess, I guess it did. Yeah. I mean, I pulled myself out, but I felt like it spat me out as well in terms of I was worn out yeah. after I worked for the beat for two years and it was, it was a great time, but. I couldn't have kept it up. I was drunk for two years. I How did it affect your music that period? Well, I was kind of, put it this way, in, in Sydney, when I was living in Sydney, I was well into music. I, had, I was always in a band or, and doing gigs. And, and I used to come here for a holiday for you know, one week to a month. And I would sort of party for that holiday and live a bit of a hedonistic version of myself and just have fun. And, and maybe do a few gigs, but mainly I was really just coming to break free and have fun. And then I'd go back to my music and friends in Sydney. And when I moved here, all of a sudden that short burst of being hedonistic and having a bit of a party turned into my full-time job. So my focus definitely wasn't my music. And then towards the end of that time with the magazine, I started to just crave and long for that music again. And, and I... And I felt like a part of me that was so important to me was shriveling up and was was going missing mm. and I was started to panic it was like I need to breathe life back into that part of myself because because the bit that I'm breathing life into doesn't have a very long life expectancy <laughs> so um so yeah so I I got out I, I got a couple of gigs a week I realized that I could make the switch to full-time music and I got out and then I moved from Seminyak up into Ungasan into a village and just dropped out for a couple of years and just really focused on music yeah. wrote an album and and just did gigs up in the book it actually like so sort of three gigs a week in the book it hardly yeah, left the nice. house so nice down there yeah and just defragged my hard drive how many um how many albums have you recorded and released i've only released two full-length albums okay. which is kind of sad to say because i've been doing it for so long but they're, they're such big missions i guess albums that um like yeah, giving, only, giving only birth. hey, like giving birth. Yeah, yeah. Well, you yeah, you got two kids, so <laughs> yeah, two actually, kids, two yeah, albums. It wouldn't be like giving birth. I've seen that. That's heavy. <laughs> yeah. So, like, let's. Um, I'm just wondering, like, so you're Australian, mm. and where'd you grow up? I grew up in the Blue Mountains, uh, in uh, yeah, Blue Mountains, one hour west of Sydney City, and uh, should we bring up how we know each other? Because that's a pretty funny <laughs> you story. Can, if you want, yeah. yeah I mean. <laughs> So it's a weird story. It's a funny. It is pretty funny. Like we. So I was born in New York. What are right, you? Yeah. I did not know that. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Does yes. that mean you can get an American passport? I've got one. Yeah. Is that because I've yeah. noticed you've been doing trips back and forth to the states? Yeah. I thought it was for musical reasons, or is it? It's well, it is. Yeah. It's music and just doing it because I should be getting back there. And also, I was chasing up my family there. Um, there's a bit of a story about my father and all that kind of stuff from from new york so i i went back there sort of four and a half years ago on a bit of a quest to look for my father and and touch base with where i was born and and use my american passport because i was like a lot of people are, would be really keen for one of these so i should utilize it um did you find what you were looking for it, uh, i wonder if i can give the short version of this story <laughs> it's quite a, it's quite a story okay uh, okay, let's swing to that, <laughs> that, that story. So I, my mother told me about my, my father when I was quite young. She, she lived in the States. She worked there for, out on Long Island as a photographer for quite a while. And she told me she was seeing this guy for about a year. She fell pregnant. He was really unhappy about it. And to the point where he didn't really want his name soiled, and he, even his father didn't want the name soiled in the town. And they basically said, look, if you want to keep the kid, you've got to, you've got to leave. And they sort of forced her to leave. So she was actually at the airport about to leave and she was a mess crying. She didn't want to because her life was there. And the woman at the airport was like, what's up? What's wrong? And she explained, I'm being forced to leave. I don't want to leave and I'm pregnant. And so the woman felt for her and they pretended to put her on the plane and snuck her out. And she, was because she thought the, the father was watching and... And um, she said, I think they're watching me and rah, rah. So they, they snuck her out and pretended to put her on the plane. And she went, and I, got, I was born in, in New York City, in Manhattan. So, which is amazing. Like that one little just sliding door right there allows me to have an American passport. And so that's, that's quite incredible. But after six months, she decided to go back to Australia. 
So anyway, flash forward years later when I was about 15, I went traveling around the, the world catching up with sort of different people in Europe and went to the States. At 15? Yeah. My mum's kind of? Pre- my, yeah, well, I was 14 when I left and and turned 15 over there. My mum's pretty out there, so she was she was like, just go. And Amazing. Help me save money and the school and everyone was against it. But anyway, I, I was going to the States, so she contacted um, my father and said, look, Atheron's going to the States. You should, go, you should see him. So while I was there... I stayed with an old friend of hers and he came and picked me up and I spent a few days sort of with him, but he, uh, he wasn't very, he obviously didn't want anyone to know that I was his son and he introduced me to everyone as his friend's son from Australia and wouldn't, everyone I met that I was kind of figuring out, oh, that must be a uncle or that must be this and that. And I met his wife and his kids, but no one knew who I was and I could tell that that wasn't even approached that subject. So he, yeah, so I was just sort of like, young and confused mm. so i left understandably and I, yeah and and two of those kids two of his his new kids were like three two to four years old Alyssa and bobby so when i went home i was sort of i was hurt about that and, and i was like whatever and i lost contact completely and years later i started reflecting on them and sort of that craving for wanting to know your past and and i wanted to know my brothers and sisters in the states and then I remembered, you know, these kids, Bobby and Alyssa, you know, they're growing up now. And, and then I hit like, I don't know, I must have been late 20s, almost 30, or probably 30 years old. And I'd had this dream of going back to New York one day and looking for them, you know, just doing everything that, I, that it would take to find this family, asking around until I, until I found them. But then all of a sudden the internet became big and this thing called Facebook blew up. And everyone was on it. So I just started Googling their names, Bobby and Alyssa Goodale. And one day, bang, they just both popped up. And I was like, holy wow. shit. Like, <laughs> so I wrote to them, very softly introduced myself as someone that visited a long time ago. And Did they remember you? They didn't remember, but it was enough to initiate them, their questioning. And so they were back and forth, obviously, with him and, and their mom and eventually they wrote to me and said what's going on who are you and then it was like hang on are you our brother what this is crazy what <laughs> this is just like him to have another kid somewhere and <laughs> so it was a bit of a hornet's nest that i'd kicked up but i was like well you know i want to know them it is what it is so flash forward eight years like i was always like well no, i'm going to come and visit you flash forward eight years this is four years ago i'm 38 and i decided to do a tour through the states so i organized gigs from new york to california and i thought this is the time to see them. So I went over and he, the word was that he wasn't too happy about me coming over and all this, but I was like, you know, I'll go anyway. Got there. When I got there, I called him and but because I was there and I was calling him, he was like, okay, come, you know, come and hang out. So I went, met them all and it was actually incredible. I was, I was really nervous. It was really nerve wracking, but I got there and there was the, there was him, his wife, his kids, all the cousins, all these different people that, wow. and everyone was really intrigued by who I was. And I'm basically, I spent, um, it's a bit of <laughs> a bit of a long story. Sorry, but no, it's I, spent, fine. I spent like three days with them, having an incredible time. Felt really connected. Even his his wife was like, "You're part of the family now," and you know, I'm so sorry you haven't been here. We haven't known you all this time, and it was quite emotional. And on the third night, the night before I was leaving to head off to a gig in uh, Washington, I, it was my first real chance to sit and have a real chat one-on-one with him. So we started talking about the past and I was thanking him for having me there. And I said, look, there's just one thing that kind of does bother me. You know, we're here now and it's great and I really appreciate it. But you haven't really done me the honor of like even sort of admitting to me that I am your son mm. and that we can move on because up until I called you like a few days ago, you didn't even want me to arrive. And he goes, well, I, I don't think you are my son. And I, and I just what? went, and I'm like, yeah, that's how I reacted. I was like, what? Well, like, and I was like, mate. What was his rationale? Well, yeah, that's the thing. I was like, mate, there's no need to go down this path. I said, look, I'm not, I'm not bitter. I'm not upset. I want to move on. Like, let's just let's just mm. enjoy what we've got now. Why would you bother saying that? You know, I don't care if you've not contacted me in the past. Anyway, he's like, 
He was like, well, your mom and I were a hot bed on a cold night. And, uh, you know, I always figured she had other boyfriends. And, and I'm like, what? This is a very different story to what my mother said. And I'd even emailed mum before leaving for New York and said, I know that you've told me this story, but just tell me again, 100% he's my father because I'm going there. Yep. And she was like, 100%. He's, he's so like, he, he, he was just... He'd been there for three days, and he said this three days later after yeah. spending all yeah. that time with them as yeah. a family. So he let all that play out. Yeah, and so, so yeah. Obviously, I was really confused, and I'm like, "What's your motivation for this? Is it to, so that you don't feel bad about the past or and not being in contact with me?" And I was like, "Man, I don't care." Mm. Anyway, so eventually, I was. I said, "Look, your story is very different to my mother's, and you know, I'm not just going to disbelieve my mother." There's one, there's obviously one solution. It's called a DNA test. Let's get this thing on the road. And he was like, oh, we don't need to do that. You you know, you're here now. Just in, And I'm like, oh, what are you talking about, dude? I need clarity and I need uh, closure on this. You really felt you needed that? Yeah, I understand. 100%. Mm. So it was a long back and forth, but eventually by the next morning, even his wife and everyone convinced him to do a DNA test. I organized it. I got my swabs. I had to leave. So I'm going out of town. I stop at a, um, at a, at a DNA lab. I book his appointment for the next, for the next, I think two days later, they got an appointment for him. I took my swabs and I left. Two days later, he rings me and he's like, oh, there's a mistake. You can't, they can't do it without you here. And I'm like, what? I ring the company that actually organized the whole appointment. And they said, oh, sorry, we, we mucked it up. You actually need a doctor's prescription with both your names on it to get it. And now you need it to be backdated to when you got your swabs. And I'm like, man, I'm never, this is never going to happen. And I was off. I was, I was traveling for two months across the States. So I basically, every city that I went to, like all the way across the States, I went and saw a doctor and I was like, this is the situation. And, and every time the doctor's like, that sounds like a lawsuit waiting to happen. There's no way... I'm, I'm going to write a prescription for a DNA test without everyone present. Mm. So I basically gave up. Um, <clears throat> and anyway, we're getting there. No, so, this is good. Let's yeah. keep going, man. So, so I've basically given up on the whole thing. And, I, and I'm obviously pretty frustrated. And I, At this point, I don't even want to think about it. I just want to focus on the gigs and, and stop stressing about it. But there's no closure in my mind. Anyway, we're in, we end up in Vegas. Yeah, what happens in Vegas should stay in Vegas, but I'll spill it on a podcast. <laughs> yeah. Um, so I'm in Vegas and I'm on Tinder, and I get, as you do, as you do, and uh, and I get this match with this girl, and she's she's about half an hour out of town, and I'm sitting with and I and I'm doing the whole road trip with two good mates, by the way. And I'm sitting with one of these mates, Davo, Davo, <laughs> and uh, you don't get Let more Aussie than that. He's from the Blue Mountains. Is he from he? Australia? <laughs> uh, so I'm with Davo, and I'm like, man. And this, this girl's like, come out to my place and, and have some dinner and some wine. And I'm saying to her, oh, I don't know, it's all, it sounds all a bit suspicious driving half an hour out of Vegas to someone's house I haven't met. And she's like, oh, I just don't want to go into town. I'm, I work tomorrow and I'm yada, yada. And we're like, do I go? Do I go? This could be dodgy. I could be losing a kidney here. And I went, ah, oh, fuck, I love, love weird shit. Let's go. Mm-hmm. Grab a bottle of vodka, jump in a cab. On the way out to her house, I tell the cab driver, look, I've never met this person. This could be a dodgy situation. Do you mind waiting out the front of the house and just waiting 10 minutes for me to stick my thumb out so that I'm, you know, I'm not being Safe. totally set up and shipped off to some Russian lab. <laughs> and um, as we, he's like, yeah, bro, I got you back. And then as we're pulling up, he goes, I'm going to wait out the front, but just to make sure you're not mugging her. I'm All like, right. what? And he goes, this is the most expensive street in Vegas, bro. She ain't going to muck. And I went, okay, you can go now. <laughs> We're good. Pull up. And there's, it's literally a mansion. She lives in a mansion. So I rock up. She turns out to be an awesome, awesome chick. She's great. We get along like a house on fire. It's all good. I stay the night. Next morning, over breakfast and coffee, I tell her this story about my father and the whole thing and the lack of closure and not being able to get a prescription for a DNA test. And she looks at me and goes, the re-, and, and another thing that had sparked my suspicion was she didn't have much social media activity. So I, that's why I was a bit s- dubious the night before. She said, look, one of the reasons I'm not on social media is I'm one of the biggest MDs in Vegas. And I'm not, why? I don't want to have a presence on social media because a lot of my hmm. uh, clients and pa- patients. Are there, yeah. 
So she goes, she just reaches to a prescription pad and goes, no what's your way. full name and what's your, what's you your father's full name? Or I'll, I'll backdate it right now. Here's a prescription. She just hands me a way. DNA prescription. I'm like, are you kidding me? And then she so goes. So Tinder does work. Tinder works, mate. <laughs> Tinder came through. And then she like, and then she's like, do you want to lift back in the Hummer or the Ferrari? And I'm like, the Ferrari. <laughs> I drive back to Vegas waving a DNA prescription in the air. No way. Going, woo. Are you kidding Winning. me? No, serious. Crazy. So rock up to my mates who are hung over and <laughs> dying from Vegas injections to the brain. And uh, it's like, man, I've got my DNA prescription. So I send it off to him to go and get his DNA test. Boom, I'm sitting in San Diego two weeks later. Results come in. No. Boom, finally got closure. No way. Yeah. And he was your dad? 100% not my 100%. father. What? <laughs> not your father? Not my father. So he was right. He was right <laughs> the whole time. <laughs> so, okay, mate, well, how, no, well, how did you feel? Oh, how did you feel? You would have felt. Dude, I would, like someone had literally like taken a zipper in the fabric of time and just gone <laughs> and just opened it up and reached through and pulled me into an alternate reality. Yeah. My, yeah, I couldn't even comprehend it at first. It was like being soccer punched to the, okay. to the brain. I was just in shock and then obviously just had to process it and then like, mum, <laughs> what's going on? So obviously, yeah, on the phone to mum and, you know, 40 something years ago, DNA tests weren't even a yeah, yeah. probability okay. in her mind. Um, yeah, so as it turns out, he was correct. I don't think their relationship was as... Well, it's very hard for me to work out. We're oh. talking about two people second guessing yeah. a, a, some time together yeah. that long ago. So yeah, I just had to process the whole, reprocess the whole thing. Sort of, you know, mum's mum's older now, and she's in her mind she'd sort of solidified that story of what happened, and she I think was under the impression that he was as well. Can I ask, like, um, did that affect your relationship with your mother? Well, it not really. I mean, we've had a sort of an interesting relationship over the years anyway. And she's sort of a very emotional... <laughs> that's the flat, mate. <laughs> yeah. We've got someone knocking at the door. Um, I can come in if they want. Yeah, she's... It didn't really affect it because I'm already very aware of how emotional she is in a lot of ways. And, mm. and she's been through a lot of hardships and she's been through a lot of breakdowns. And um, so... It was a shock and I was angry, surface angry, that I'd been misled and that mm. and all of those surface emotions of anger and shock and obviously went through. But ultimately, there's no point being angry. Mm. Like, there's no point letting it affect my relationship with her. And I just wanted to talk her through it and gain a better insight mm. into what the truth was. Mm. And, I just had, and I just had to be understanding that she's an older person and there's no point dragging mud, dragging anyone through mud now and all that sort of stuff. So. Yeah, it's funny, like, as a kid and teenager, adult, I mean, I've, I still do it. We sort of put our parents up on a pedestal and we we have this expectation of perfection for them, mm. you know, but, uh, you know, they're not. And um, it's it's kind of hard to accept when you you get old enough to realise that, you know, they've fucked up a lot as well. Just yeah. as just as I've fucked up, you know. And um and forgiving them for it <coughs> it's gotta be one of the biggest challenges ever. I think it's often a an actual moment too when you just get hit with that fact. It's not always an easy moment, but it's when you realise that your parents aren't that they're not gods, that they're not yeah. like the be all and end all of yeah. perfection and that they've got it all worked out. Like you sort you sort of look at them and go, Ah, oh, I still remember that moment with my mother when I when I, I w I'd been through a lot with my mother and sort of we'd actually I'd actually sort of cut her off for a couple of years this when I was younger just through through for some different reasons but mm. I remember looking at her when we were sort of reunited and she said a few things she's very very heavily spiritual Christian so is my mother yeah which gets back to our, how we met mm. um, and she sort of said a bunch of things in front of me about God talking to her and getting the Holy Spirit going through a body and getting all these shivers and I remember just looking at her and going wow you really do believe that like that's you as a human that's your path that's what you believe and it didn't make me 
didn't upset me or it didn't make me feel like I was being manipulated by it anymore. I just saw her as a separate person who was just a human who had her own beliefs and just yeah. just on her own journey. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. And trying to trying to survive mm. the best she can, you know. It's funny you talk about that because I you know, I really for years criticized my mother for her beliefs and the way she chose to live. Um, you know, she never really even forced it on me. Um, mm. She did as a kid a little bit. And, you know, I often blamed her for a lot of shit that happened in our life, you know, um, because of her beliefs. But um, as time's gone on, she's stayed so true to her sense of spirituality that um, I don't know how she would have, <coughs> excuse, excuse me, how she would have survived some of life's challenges without that. Mm. And, you know, she's getting older now and she is just a, a beautifully, <sighs> shit, I just got emotional. She's like a beautifully <laughs> um, compassionate, loving woman who just has this deep sense of peace within her. I, I see it, yeah. you know. Um, yeah, that caught me off guard. Yeah, um, that's good. That's good. Yeah, so, um, and so now I'm my whole mindset's changed a lot towards that. It's, um, I, I do believe that spirituality is necessary mm. and what, what form it takes is up to the individual. You know, yeah. um, I was very much like you repelled by that Christian, mm. um, that cloak of Christianity that, and all the, the stuff that comes with it. But, um, I think when you strip that away, it, you know, it's, it's real. Yeah. In well, my opinion. So it's, it really just can't like, anyone's journey is obviously their journey and if and if it helps them and guides them and gives them a better sense of purpose and happiness inner happiness true happiness um not sort of a fake road to wanting happiness when you when when they're always unsettled but if it brings someone true inner peace it's an amazing beautiful thing what you what you hope is that they don't then use that and try and persuade or manipulate others with it because that's when it becomes dangerous. But I often, I often also think that when people are, are really pushy with it, they don't have as much inner peace as they say they do. Agreed. It seems to be a reflection of, you know, their desperation to force it on other people seems to be coming from an agitated place, which doesn't seem so peaceful. Oh, exactly. That's yeah. the key word. I, that if, if they feel that they need to be doing that and, uh, yeah, well, they're not maybe right with themselves and they can't sit with themselves mm. so anyway shit just got real <laughs> yeah so <laughs> that's which is the, which, sorry go oh, i was just gonna for anyone listening like that i think it's a funny reflection of of both of our histories is that that's how we met so my mother yeah that's right my mother when i was how old were we like oh, see, we're born i'm in the really same glad year, you're so. telling the story because my memories of it are really vague mm. i remember you and i remember your face but i just i can't quite i was trying to think about it on the way over here actually i i can't think about how it all transpired well i think because i've got a really strong memory for early early childhood yeah and it's you know my last number of alcoholic and drug fucked up years of <laughs> uh, 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 not so but i think when you move around a lot when you you staple memories in yeah. rather than it just sort of dissipating into one big dissolve but so because I moved around a lot quite very young, I think I can remember things, and, and this was obviously a move. So we, I was on in the Blue Mountains. Mum decided to do a Bible course in Nowra, three hours south. And while she was doing that Bible course, she became friends with your mother. They formed like a spiritual women's prayer meeting group <laughs> so that was like, I think they were saving the world from the apocalypse <laughs> or something. And, <laughs> and we just happened to be the kids that would, run around just do whatever we wanted daunt playing knock and run on people's doors yeah, getting outside getting up to mischief getting up to mischief while they were praying and saving the saving the world <laughs> saving the universe apparently um <laughs> and we're terrorizing the neighborhood yeah and i rem you you really stand out for me because I, I remember well i remember at the time i really looked up like you were like the one i remember you were like a a really strong representation of someone who gave me friendship really? at that time yeah like it no way it yeah it's quite a it's quite a strong memory that that at that time, like I was hanging out around with the Fraser family, the family of the pastor who I was running the Bible course, because I ended up in a yeah. in a band with Lindsay Fraser. But oh right, yeah, no um, way, yeah, that was my that's a whole story that I ended up with those guys. But yeah. but at the time, outside of them, 
you were like you know, mum's going to this prayer group. Oh, at least I'm going to play with Shannon. And yeah, you were, right. and you were quite a um, rebellious. Like you were a little bit more <laughs> rebellious and a bit more sort of cheeky and who gives a shit than me. Really? And I think that naturally made me look up to you more. Really? Yeah, I think when, when someone's a bit more rebellious, yeah. the lesser rebellious one looks up at them, as who, kids especially. Who do you think's more rebellious now? <laughs> oh, shit, I don't know, <laughs> What is rebellion? I don't know. Is it anti anti West? I put it this know. way, man. I put my daughter to sleep at seven thirty last night. I was in okay. bed at eight o'clock. Yeah, I was maybe, in bed at eight o'clock. Maybe I'll claim the rebellion <laughs> then. <laughs> <laughs> Not drinking yeah, much right. beer. Stuff. See, look. For, oh God, for me to hear these things, it's like, wow, what a trip down memory lane. And I, I feel like I've. So we should should also explain. Keep that, going. Yeah. That, that just to cap that off, that after six months, the Bible course is over. Mum rips me back out of that area back to the blue mountains and we never speak or see each other again and ever then, again I know. ever again ever again and it's all just forgotten and then how long ago two years ago no it was dude i was thinking about it, it was it was 2012 that we reconnected oh what i was here on a and the reason i Holy remember shit, it was seven years the ago. only reason i remember is because we came over in 2012 on a holiday and at the time, um, I was with a couple of buddies and our mutual friend, Danny, Danny Nighttime, fucking legend. Yeah. <laughs> love that. How can Total you not legend. love that guy? Yeah. But anyway, he um, he knew I was coming over to Bali and he's like, dude, you got to go and hang out with my mate, Athron. He's like, you, you, two was, you two would really get along. I just can feel <laughs> you'd really get along. <laughs> and you I went, yeah, no worries. And I think he connected us on Facebook. You know, yeah. And, um... You're like, yeah, bro, for sure. Come and come and see me. I'm playing a gig somewhere, and I think we went we went to watch you, and we met up, and I think we had a, had a night out. But before before we met up, I looked at the message and saw Shannon Ferrugia, and I was like, that name rings a whoa. And I remembered, hang on, that's the guy that I hung like that's the same name as the guy that I hung out really? with when I was nine was or it, ten. Was it negative though? Were you like, oh, that guy was a prick? No, no, no. I had really fond memories of us I, I carry out. a lot of fear around that sometimes ah, right. I, there's things I forget and then people say oh, I remember you from back when and I remember thinking I was a fucking dirtbag back then oh look I remember you being a cheeky rebellious kid but like I said I, I looked up to you and like you were like the guy that I hung out with and we like yeah we would, I can't believe that yeah we were like running amok on the streets and it was good fun yeah. mm. and I was like man it's the same name as that kid that I knew back then and then I click on your Facebook profile and your profile picture is a picture of you when you were 10 so it was literally like that's him that's my actual memory of him and dude and no shit the only reason I had that photo up around that time is because an old friend of mine took a photo of me skateboarding when I was like 11 or 12 and sent it to me like he's like I I just scanned (laughs) this and I'm like that's sick that's my new Facebook you know and it only just randomly, I'd only just put it up. Because I, that's so random. Because, <laughs> yeah, because I, I knew I'd heard, I think, that you were, or maybe you were already into skateboarding, but I knew you were linked to skateboarding. Mm. So when I saw that profile pic, I was like, well, that's him, and he's on a skateboard. So what the, he- oh, I couldn't believe it. Yeah. And Danny's it's like, cool. you guys know each other? Typical. Yeah. <laughs> Do you stay in touch with Danny much or? Yeah, yeah, man. We're, we're great mates. Um, Cause you've got I, a real bond through music. I mean, he's an yeah. amazing musician. Uh, he's actually one of the, he's, he's just so creative. It's just and innate. he's funny, man. He's, he's oh. a funny motherfucker. He, uh, w- what's the code of swearing on this podcast, by the way? Yeah. <laughs> man, you can say whatever you want. Oh, good. Rock and roll. Um, but yeah, so what were we saying? Um, Denny. Yeah, he's just super, super funny, super creative. and Yeah, I stay with those guys. <laughs> usually when I go back to Sydney. Do you find in the course of your life, I mean, I guess being a musician, you're you're drawn to certain people. Has that just been a common theme for you? Um, You know, just being drawn to musos. Like, is that all you hang out with? Like, are you only... Uh, Not not particularly. I think I've, I've had a lot of friends from different walks of life just because I've been drawn to them for other reasons. I think actually, but, but obviously that's a strong part of it. Mm. And, in different phases of my life when I've been more heavily involved in music, I've, I've been drawn to other musicians and, and a lot of my friendship circles, close friendship circles have been around that music scene. I guess when I've lunged into a different place, like when I first moved to Bali and I did the magazine, I was like the one muso in my friendship group for a few years. Mm-hmm. Um, 
which is which is great in some ways, but in other ways, I, I really missed having that music around me all the time. And and then since then, um, I'm still friends with a lot of those guys. But my my the guys that are often just here at the house, and I'm spending most of my time now with musicians because it's what I want to be surrounded by, and it's what I want to be doing all the time. So um. So I don't know if I'm saying yes or no to that, but yeah, I'm definitely <laughs> surrounded by a lot of musicians. I guess we are, that's how. But we But it wasn't always it. like that. It's not always like that. So no. when it's you not only like that, I guess is what I'm saying. Growing up in the Blue Mountains, mm. you went to school there, yeah. primary school and high school. Yeah, went to um, yeah, ki- yeah, right, right through. I mean, I left home when I was 17 mm-hmm. and moved up to the Gold Coast to be in a band with Lindsay Fraser. Mm-hmm. Um, so. Did you like do the whole I'm packing up and I'm 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 going to be in a band? And yeah, pretty much. Like I like chasing the dream. Yeah, I kind of did. I went for a holiday up and hung out with those with Lindsay and and he was in a band and they didn't have a singer. And I was going through a pretty turbulent time at home, just sort of there was a lot going on in my in the home that I probably didn't realize was going on like because I was in the middle of it but in retrospect it was a pretty heavy period for me and so I sort of was wanting to get out and and all of a sudden I go on a holiday up into the Gold Coast and there's a band and they want a singer and I love singing and mm. so it was on I just went back and said mum I want to move to the Gold Coast and she was she she allowed me yeah she you know she didn't really I think I don't know if I gave her much of a choice but but she was cool she she facilitated it and so, um, when did you, like, I want to go back to the start. Like, when did you first get into music? Like, when did you pick up a guitar? Did you have, a, like, a music teacher that really got you started? Definitely. Was it just something that just music spoke teacher to you? That got me started. <laughs> My music teacher was like, you know, uh, yeah, a, a guy that looked like he should have been in IT. Right eating way too many burgers and socks pulled up to his waistline. <laughs> and like, yeah, Mr. Cooney, he de- definitely you remember his name though? Yeah, I do, man. I How remember interesting. His name. Yeah, he definitely turned me off music. Um, You've got a good memory. <laughs> early childhood memory. <laughs> um, now, I I started, I started singing before I played guitar. How old was that? About 14, 15. I remember... It was when the whole grunge thing came in, I think. I don't know if it was sort of... I think it was instigated by just (coughs) suddenly loving music. Yeah, when I heard Nirvana and Pearl Jam and those guys, I went from like always just hearing Christian church music to hearing something that truly... I was... My thought was these guys know how to say how they... Like speak their feelings through through voice. And at the time, I I was already writing a lot of poetry. um, Yeah. Yeah, I just off just as a hobby. Well, I'd kept a diary since I was ten, and then when I was, I think fourteen, my mother read. I came home and she'd read all my diaries. She'd broken into my cabinet and read all my diaries, and I didn't keep dates in my diaries because I just it was just fluid thought. But I had lots of stuff in there. Like I'd tried shoplifting. I'd tried marijuana. I'd <laughs> tried. I'd looked at porn. I'd like all these things I'd written about. So she read it all as just one big admission of guilt and I got hell ripped out of me. No. So I was I was shattered. So then my the way to keep writing after that experience was I would write in code, which I guess was poetry. Like I would write I swapped thoughts for butterflies, I swapped uh, like I had all these different expressions that would represent things. And so I kept writing a journal of my what was going on in my life, but it was written in code which looked like poetry and then when i saw these bands i loved i started going man you can you can sing your poetry and you can mean it you know it's not you don't just have to sing to jesus and uh yeah and then i started i had a mate at school that was also sort of doing the same thing so we used to sneak out our windows at night meet under a railway bridge and just and sing like at two in the morning like we just got right into singing so is that because the acoustics were good under there? Yeah, yeah. So you were even like picking out where the acoustics were good. Like you started thinking It was more, thinking it was more about way. hoping my voice had a chance to sound good so I'd sing somewhere where it sounded like an exaggerated shower, basically. <laughs> did, did you carry yeah. a lot of like, um, I guess, around your voice when you started out? Were you very self-conscious about it? Or did yeah, you feel very. Like I, I'm not a natural singer. I was very much just a throat singer 
and so I didn't have any kind of natural control or vibrato or or anything like that at all. I loved singing, and I and I know pitch, so that was cool. But but I definitely wasn't a singer. I couldn't sing like naturally. So actually, even when I moved to the Gold Coast and joined that rock band, we sort of got semi signed to a to a label and the guy at the label said you need to learn to sing properly he could tell i was a throat singer because i'd go red in the face screaming at gigs just for those that don't know like can you describe the difference between a throat singer and someone that sings from their diaphragm yeah well i guess if you're singing from your throat you're using all the muscles in your throat and around your larynx and your vocal cords you're using them all to push out this sound which is just straining those muscles and will actually cause your vocal your larynx and your vocal cords to be strained and and end up giving up or swelling or having issues whereas what you want to do is all that should be completely relaxed and you Mm. should be pushing your you should be pushing from deep down in the bottom of your stomach from where um, your diaphragm is and it should just be no like the the air should just be passing through and causing your vocal cords to naturally quaver and make the right sound, not not forced. I don't know if that's a good description. I think it's a great it. description. Um, and it, it, it does it lend to more control and better sound? Absolutely. Like, yeah, it it, it means your vocal cords become a gateway that that play with the the set, play with the str- um, the tone and the intonation of the sound rather than attempting to make the sound themselves. It's like a sound's passing through them and then it just sort of plays with it, whether it's an ooh or an ah or an ow. And, but, but really the, strength, the, the push of the note is coming from deep down in your stomach. Here's a question for you. Do you feel that anyone can learn to sing? Well, yeah. It's because using the, the, the correct technique and learning that and developing the, the correct muscles and absolutely. reflexes. Anyone, it's, to me, it's just another instrument. Okay. So everyone assumes that you can or you can't sing. But like no one, no one is born, and they can or can't play guitar. No one is born and can or can't play piano. You you have to learn it. Like, so your body is an instrument too, and you can or you can't learn to play it. But it's not a matter of were you born able to play it. So some people naturally just do sing from their diaphragm naturally, and they're great singers. They just happen to just uh, they've gone that way physically. But anyone can learn it. But I'm not saying anyone can learn to do it with genuine feeling and mm. or, or <clears throat> not everyone that learns to sing is going to have the same amount of ability to you know because some of my favorite singers like i mean i'm not a muso and like but i love music um and i've always I've j- it was just something I, i've tried and i just didn't take to i just don't have the skill i don't know like it just never never worked for me I, I found my talents elsewhere but always have had a deep appreciation for it but some of my favorite singers are the most uh, are usually the most imperfect as well mm. you know like um anthony Kiedis, for example uh i seen him live with the red hot chili peppers and he really like i mean i, I didn't have, you didn't have to be a genius to critique him and go that guy sounds like shit <laughs> but i absolutely loved every word that came out of his mouth you know what? what what's the difference between that because there are a shitload of people out there who have an amazing voice but no one wants to listen to them man it's so what's the difference the difference sorry excuse me the difference is literally to me is soul and and bearing truth like put it this way i could I could watch someone play the perfect Joe Satriani or St- uh, Steve Vai solo, like note for note, absolutely perfectly because they've learnt the notes, they've learnt the scales, they've learnt the finger work and they get up and they they redo it perfectly note by note. But I just, I might watch them live and think, wow, they are skilled, they have learnt to do that very well. But I still mightn't truly feel it. Like it just might seem mathematical. It might come across as mathematical to me. Whereas, and I remember, I still remember a moment when I recognised this. I could see a girl get up, which is, I'm just retelling a story. I saw a girl get up when I was when I was younger to perform once, and she wasn't that good on guitar. And to the point where she actually grabbed the mic, grabbed a mic, and put it down to her stomach at one point, and just slapped her stomach to do a beat, and then pl- sang a song. But it was. And it was so simple and it wasn't musically skillful, but it was so beautiful and raw. And the way she sang it, 
she didn't hit super high notes or super low notes, but the way she sang it was so incredibly raw and emotional that like it brought me to tears. And I realized that it's not about, yeah, there's something about raw honesty and people smell it a mile away. People they feel do. it. They, they, they know it. Like it's, especially now with this whole <coughs> social media phenomena where everyone's trying to express who they really are. Mm. I mean, it's so see-through when you can tell that someone's because faking because it. Because music taps into something deeper. Mm. Do, you, do you think that playing music is where you find your sense of spirituality? Um, I mean, definitely in a, in a, in a big way, there's, I'm, I'm trying to think if it's spirituality or, I mean, it's always been the, the happiest place I've ever been and ever gone to. And well, it's I always, I don't want to use the word passion. I think passion gets thrown around. Oh, it's my passion. It's my passion. Like, yeah, I, right. and I get that. It is like, if you're doing it every day, day in, day out, because it's something you really enjoy for sure. But is it, is it, so is it like feeding your soul? Oh yeah. I mean. Mm. It's the thing that's fed my soul from, from from as far back as I can remember. Something feeding my soul. Do you think that's what sustained such like? I mean, I would consider it a long career. I mean, I think trying to make a living out of music. Uh, it's, I mean, it's up there with trying to become a professional actor or mm. a sports person. It's. I mean, it's such a tough. It seems like such a tough thing to crack, and and you've cracked it, in my opinion. You, it, I mean, you've you've made it like it's your sole in, sole source of income. Mm. So, you know, you must be doing something right to to get people to want to keep watching you and and listening to you and seeing you. So, there's al- it's also a yeah. Th- there's that stupid level of being so so into something that you just can't stop doing it. Like it's, I guess that's the difference. Is some losing my mic there's um <laughs> get some viagra in that thing <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah, fully went limp man what the hell um there's you know like i know other people that sort of were sort of into music and loved mm. the idea of being in a yeah. band when we were young and very quickly it sort of fell away and they focused on other things and it wasn't something that truly fed their soul i guess as gotcha. you put it so they they left it to the wayside and they focused on other things and Whereas other people, and I know this for myself, is that it's so obsessively the one thing that makes you happy, like to a point where it Why? doesn't matter if you're living on couches and eating two minute noodles for years. It just, as long as you have that moment in the music, jamming with other people, getting on a stage, being able to share it with other people, it's so steeply satisfying. Addictive? It's addictive, yeah. And what, what are you striving for? Are you striving? You're, you're striving to... It's like a drug. You're, you're, you're striving to always get to that moment where you're in that zone where you don't think about it. Okay. Because so much time, I mean, like, if you think about it like a, you know, a young dude looking for sex, like, how much time does he spend running around... For that moment. For that one small moment. Mm. He spends so much time, whether it's on Tinder or out, you know, having dates or... it's just Yeah. You know, a young endorphin-induced dude looking mm. for sex. Whereas music's kind of the same thing. Like, the the amount of time that you get to truly just be in the moment and having this incredible connection and relationship with it. And with the people you're playing with? Yeah, and with the people you're playing with. So, do you ever have moments on stage with your band or a band, whoever you're playing with at the time, and you you all just click and everything's, like, tight and flowing well and yeah i mean that's that's what i'm that's, talking about that's what you're chasing yeah it's moments. just it's so does it matter indis- if you have a big crowd no i mean i mean that is a another whole thing that's another whole incredible beautiful moment like there's nothing like that either but it's 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 just as attainable in a room with just you and the musicians that zone when you're in the zone you're in the zone okay. like and, and I, I'm called the zone because it's a it's a classic it's sort of a cliched name for it, but everyone that's a musician sort of knows that as the term. How long? Okay, let's say you have those moments. You might you might jam this afternoon with your buddies, and mm. and you have it. You, you might write a new song, and it just feels awesome. How long does that satiate you for? Before you need it again, you mean? Mm. Is it is it long lasting, or are you well, just? 
is that why like is it just a couple of days of like oh man we had the sickest jam or we just played the best gig to me it usually <laughs> or is it just the once next you walk morning off stage? i wake up it's mm. uh, you you can't wait to be back in it it's it's usually for me like i mean it's a lifetime of satisfaction and it's a moment satisfaction at the same time i mean it's it's what you do it for it's what you live for but at the same time yeah you could have an amazing gig or an amazing jam and when it's finished you are actually exhausted you can't just do it straight away again like gotcha. and that exhaustion of of feeling it and feeling all those emotions come out is so full on that you you do have that satisfaction of well i've done it today i've felt it and and you go to bed later with a smile on your face because you're like, wow, that was a really good jam or that mm. I really felt that or that was such a good connection with those musicians or the crowd or this, whatever. But when you wake up the next morning, you've got that fresh energy and you you do have the energy to do it again. So therefore, you need to do it again. Okay. <laughs> yeah. So you start to get some momentum. Yeah. Yeah. So is that why like when you maybe have a bit of a break from it, you find it hard to get back into it and you've sort of lost your, lost your mojo a little bit? Um. I don't know if you ever really have a break from it. Like you, I don't think I've ever really had a, like think I've had distractions that have pulled me away from being involved as heavily as I wanted to in music, but I would never, I would never ever make a mental decision to have a break from music. Gotcha. Like it cracked me up when I saw that headline of, you know, not that I want to bring him into the conversation, but when Justin Bieber said he was retiring from music at age 22 or something, it was like, you don't actually retire from music. If you, if you're like, how do you retire from music? If it's everything you love and I get, it's part of your being, it's part of your being. Like I get, yeah, he might've been just wanting to take a break. He's 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 famous as as weird gets, but you don't ever want to take a break from something so incredible. Are you, are you chasing that kind of dream? Are you chasing a dream? I guess there's always there's always a chase involved of wanting to get to the next level. Is of like I'd be lying if I oh, said what's the next level? It's funny. Like there's there's always a next level. There's always a better place to be with your music. There's always a better uh, opportunity that you could be in to to make the zone easier and more attainable. And I guess that. Uh is circumstantial like like the things that frust you want the things that frustrate you within the music industry to be less okay so so you think when you get to those next levels of fame that those things become easier like you you, you're not packing up all your gear at the end of the night and and carrying amps and guitars to the car i think that you're not having to find a good sound guy you know the sound is or sorted. You're, now you're nailing it. Okay. Yeah. Like so, ca- carrying the shit doesn't really bother and you're not, me. And you don't have to worry because you know that there's some dude who knows what he's doing there. And yeah. Because that, that's probably a big worry. That's the know? stuff. Like there's a lot of stuff around do, like managing yourself and get, getting to these gigs that where they don't really, they're not really aware of how sound works or whether the sound system is the right sound system or all that sort of stuff and they can really depreciate your experience like you know you go to a gig and you want to just perform to your best potential and be lost in that zone and share that zone you're in gotcha. with the audience gotcha. because when you're in it they'll feel it but if you can't get into the work due to something outside an external force like the sound system's just sounding horrible mm. or there's no speaker that's you can't hear yourself properly and so you're not playing quite well or you know that reflects and you know the audience picks it up because they can see you're not in that mm. beautiful place that you want to be in. Because you're distracted. Yeah, so you just end up getting, you walk, you get home just going, ah, oh, like I know what I want to do and what I, what I can. So you achieve. want, you want zone convenience. <laughs> zone convenience, mate. Give me some ZC. <laughs> I want some ZC in my life. Bring it on. But yeah, like, so like, you know, because really how much is enough? I mean, like, like I was just saying before, I mean, when will enough ever be enough? In the, uh, I see it not just with music, with a lot of people. It's mm. like, I don't know, like especially uh, when we talk about money and that sort of stuff, you know, people get to those levels of financial success and, and then there's something else and then there's something else. It's like, yeah, is, it, is that like that with music? Well, I think it also goes with life stages and age, okay? Like there were definitely 
periods in my in my twenties where, along with wanting to be in that zone more often, hmm. I the idea of being rich and famous was very appealing. Like I was young and I just want, you know, I wanted for all the booze and drugs and women and anything I could handle. I wanted to go through it all and rip it all to shreds. And I wanted all that to come easily because I wanted to be famous and it have would you, be. Have you had those rock star moments? Well, I've probably pushed myself <laughs> into some dark corners to get as much <laughs> of that as possible over the years. Um, I've certainly been through some weird shit. Have you ever done some stuff and you're like, that's so rock star? Yeah, I mean, I guess. I think most people living in Bali have or anyone that sort of <laughs> <laughs> loves to live in weird chaotic places <laughs> has been through some pretty weird moments where you go, what is actually going on right now? <laughs> um, but yeah, the funny thing is as you get old, as I've gotten older, the only thing that's remained there is my love for that. Like the, the, you know, I've even, I've given up booze lately, maybe not, probably not forever, but why? But I just, for, I don't think it was doing me any good anymore. I I was getting a lot of anxiety. Was it ruining ruining your creativity or? Uh, Probably, yeah. Um, I was going through, I was battling a lot with anxiety and depression and I didn't realize how linked, even though it seems obvious, I didn't realize how linked it was to that. Mm. I was sort of just assuming I should stop drinking because I drink a lot when I drink and I was sick of wasting mornings and I want to utilize my time better. But I noticed now that I have stopped how all the, and it's a few factors, but anxiety and depression have fallen away. I feel better about myself. I feel have more clarity. All those cliche things that everyone talks about are actually true, true. believe it or not. <laughs> <laughs> well, what do you know? <laughs> um, yeah, so something I've realized now is that... wasn't serving you. Yeah. And then like the bigger point is that at the end of the day, all that fame and fortune you can be chasing with music, really at the end of the day, all you want is more music and better, better circumstance to play it. And yeah and all that kind of stuff yeah yeah like better um i i I, it's funny um i didn't think you were going to go that direction i thought you're going to go no i want more fame more money but yeah the way you put it like yeah i want more i want more convenience for those moments to happen Mm. and i I get that because that's where the satisfaction is because there must be so much struggle like i don't think uh i think sometimes on the surface we can see people such as yourself and and go oh like it's just so easy for him he's you know, he plays gigs on this rooftop over the rice paddy fields and he plays gigs, at, I don't know, he plays gigs regularly through mm. the week and whatever. Oh, it must be so easy, but they probably don't understand the struggle it, the struggle involved in, in getting to those points and creating those moments. And I'm sure yeah, it's vast. I mean, mate, it's been, I mean, I'm 42. And like <laughs> today? Today. Today. <laughs> yeah. 77, um, baby. 77. Uh, yeah, I mean... Oh man, there's been a lot of ups and downs, and when you put music first, you just you're choosing a pretty rocky road, mm. and uh, and you know, and I'm super fortunate in that I am in the position I'm in now because I'm not the only one that tries hard to put music first. There are so thousands of musicians, oh. a thousand times better than me, who have also put music first all their lives, and they haven't just through circumstance haven't ended up in a position where they're being able to play gigs for a living and so Mm. like i do really appreciate that it's not just me winning through my perseverance it's also i'm very lucky to to have so when you play gigs is it um you know cover songs your bread and butter pay the bills with the covers the the gigs at all these beach bars you have to play uh covers to to even get that gotcha get those gigs you won't even get yeah but my the way that I, I think the reason that I get the gigs is that I, I do them differently. Like, and for my own sanity, I can't just play covers. Like I just couldn't do it. It would drive me crazy. So I use a loop pedal and I use a whole bunch of effects and I recreate songs in my own fashion. So I'll, ah. whether it's twisting songs together or playing, you know, <clears throat> a rock song in reggae format yeah. or, but some of those punters, they they know they know that melody, they know that. Yeah, melody. and yeah. St- so you're still you're still hitting those, hitting those points of, um, of I guess uh, familiarity. Yeah. yeah, and the the thing for me is because I'm I love writing original music. 
that means I get to write original music and then just put the melody of a familiar song in there, weave it through. No way. And by doing that, the venue's happy because they hear me doing something that's familiar. The audience is happy because they, they're like, what song is this? Oh, I don't recognize this. And, and, and it's they, original. And it's different, but it's original. And it, and it gives me that satisfaction of playing, jamming out my own original music, but just throwing in familiar stuff and familiar melodies to make it make it work for those environments creative expression yeah and the good thing is with these gigs i can like you know last night at the intercon i played out of three sets of 45 minutes i played about almost a set and a half of original songs and no one really as long as you're throwing the covers in there as well once you've got the audience's attention and or you know they're happy with what you're doing you can throw in originals because they're happy to hear it at that point so, so it works you've got them hooked in yeah. yeah you've got that once you've got the connection you can sort of go yeah you can just mention it. and then and then you've got dialogue with the audience you know if you pe- see people paying attention and 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 uh looking and listening then you can make a dialogue and then telling them that this is an original song is something there's a more of a connection with them really yeah so you said like you had a bit of a break from from drinking and then i noticed just recently you put yourself in that um in that creative space of producing 22 songs in 22 days which really hooked me in when i seen it on social media i was like mm-hmm. all right good luck with that buddy when you did the <laughs> first one and then i was actually like i'll be honest with you like the first two i was like okay he's, he's pumped out too good on him <laughs> there's no way he'll get to 22 um <laughs> do you, and you did <laughs> just, <laughs> just got there. But what, what oh, I was I super impressed about, then I'm watching it going, holy shit, like him and his buddies are also recording like film clips to go with it. <laughs> um, and then obviously then you then you have to promote it on social media, uh, you know, um, day in, day out. Like, So do you feel that you fit, you had a bit more energy to do that kind of stuff? And, and or why? Why did you want to do it? There's a, there's a few reasons. I mean, I did it two two years ago. I did a similar thing, twenty one songs in twenty one days, and it was for the same sort of reasons. You, it's when you've got time in Bali, you you can waste it very easily. Like oh it's yeah. it's, <laughs> it's one of those places, you know. And especially if I'm gigging, sort of four nights a week, well, what are you going to do with the rest of your time? You can either you really utilize it and and get a lot out of it, or you can just let it slide by and mm. just be catching up with people and having coffees and and just wasting wasting time if you want to be getting somewhere so for me it was it's like i hate wasting time and the older you get the more you hate wasting time so i was like this is a this is a way of not only utilizing my time it's also the length of time is habit forming like three weeks is long enough to make something really habit forming so if you force yourself to be every day doing something for three weeks by the end of it you're in a mode you're in a you just that's you're in go mode you Mm. you can't just switch it off so i wanted to put myself in a position where i was just utilizing time getting better getting more skilled and also i've always got as a songwriter i've always got melodies and songs floating around in my head and i i often improvise songs and riffs at gigs and because of that i often don't finish them i don't like finalize them i don't finish the lyrics and i don't and even if i do i mightn't ever record it because i always think ah, oh, but i've got to do it so well that i need a <sighs> studio and i need this therefore i never do it because it's never going to be good enough but if you just say no nah, i've got to write record video and release a song every day by the end of this song by the end of this day you're just forcing yourself to by any means necessary get it done so you, you let the perfectionism slide away a little yeah, bit yeah yeah and um, yeah, do the work because I reckon as a musician, it, it must be so easy to get halfway through something and then just sort of lose interest or dr- let it drop away. So, out of the twenty-two songs, um, how many of them did you absolutely love? Yeah, there's a few. There's well, there's quite a few. Like I got, I got, I've definitely got new sets of original music out of it, and and a nice sort of thing with that is. When you're throwing it out there and you're putting it on social media and you, you're seeing the feedback, it's often the stuff you don't expect that resonates with people, which is always funny because you, and you have to sort of take that. You can't um, yeah, it's interesting. get upset by it. Like it, there, there are songs that as you can, I can personally feel attached to that I, 
that I'm like, oh, that's a melody that I feel is really like evokes something in me. And mm. I might <clears throat> play it thinking, oh, this is the one that's going to resonate. And it mightn't really resonate. And then another song that like literally you're pract- I've practically recorded and written at the same time in one burst. And it's, to me is just a, a, a moment of emotional release. And that might be the one that people are like, that's the song that really got me. And you've got to go, okay. And also it might even be in a style that you're not, that I'm not generally pushing for myself. And then I go, oh, okay, well, I've got to accept that. Like maybe, maybe I need to shift my style a bit to resonate with more people. It doesn't mean that I'm going to play a style I don't like, but it's just another part of me that I haven't really focused on. Maybe I should focus more on that. Like there was, um, like a, a, two examples, there was one song I did that was an acapella song, which I've never, I really enjoy playing with my loops. But there was one song where I thought, look, I should just put the guitar down and just do a vocal acapella loop song. So I, you know, did this, I'm shit at beatboxing, but I did a basic go, beatbox. Go. And then, no, no. I <laughs> did a basic beatbox and then sang and looped it over the top and did this acapella piece. And that ended up being a track that people really liked. And how did you um, feel about it though? I was really happy with it. Happy like with I, it. I, yeah. yeah, I really okay. enjoyed it. I, it was a, it was called Anxiety Sounds Like, and it was a, it was for me an expression of what I'd been through earlier this year with battling with anxiety attacks, and so it was a really, I, I did personally relate to it, but it was definitely in a direction I don't usually do, and I didn't, I sort of thought it just might be a, people might just go, oh, that was a bit, bit of fun, but, but no, people liked that song more, um, more than others, and then there's another one I did that was more of a electronic beat song that um i i wrote acoustically and then collaborated with ian stevenson a good mate of mine who was on a lot of them and he he's incredible with his production and songwriting skills himself he's, he's amazing and he in the studio he he turned it into a more of an electronic track which i don't often go down that path and that song really resonated with people and um yeah so it's yeah, it's hard to pick. Some, push me in some new directions. Yeah. So it's hard to pick. Hard to pick what's going to resonate, hey? Yeah, but what one thing I really have found is that it's often the songs that you write the quickest, and that were the easiest to write that resonate the most. And that comes back to that thing we talked about before of raw honesty is what touches people more than mm. this big charade of well, no, I shouldn't, I shouldn't say charade, but massive amounts of planning to to capture people interesting yeah you can spend all day trying to come up with the most ingenious way of getting someone's attention when often it's just the most simple real emotional moment where Mm. someone is grabbed and they they feel connected to you it's so interesting i mean i'm even starting to notice it with the podcast i mean you'll be episode 13 Mm. and i'm and i've done a couple where i've actually finished it and just like walked out the door and got out to the car park and give myself a high five I went that was fucking awesome and sounded amazing and you know they said some really cool stuff and I said some really cool stuff and I'm gonna change the world you know like you know and then I look at the stats on it afterwards (laughs) no hardly any listens or people just weren't that hyped on it and then I've actually I've done a couple where people have actually been sending me private messages saying oh my god you said this and so and so said this and it just really um was the the piece of the jigsaw puzzle that i needed to hear wow that's great and i didn't even give it two thoughts (laughs) so it's for me it's a reminder that we really don't have a lot of control over Mm. things like we just have to try to surrender and go with what what's feeling right in the moment and trying to be as present as possible and i feel like musicians i mean you're talking about being in that zone I, i kind of I kind of see it as like being as present as anyone could ever be in life at a certain time, you know, because, and you sort of talked about anxiety because I'm going to, I'm going to identify with you there. Anxiety has been a, a, a part of my story too, mm. quite, quite heavily. Um, and uh, I realized it was because I was, I was getting further and further from the present moment in my head, mm. either too far in the, in the future, predicting, stressing, problem solving, thinking. Or in the past, going wishing, remorseful, shame, yeah, blah, blah, blah. and it wasn't, <clears throat> and uh, yeah, um, I sort of lost my train of thought. But I found once I'm in the present moment and and sort of working off feel a little bit more just in life, mm. you know, whether it be doing stuff at my job or with my kids, 
um, definitely having better feelings. I'm not feeling that. Oh, like I mean, sometimes anxiety can just be, it can be so debilitating, you know. It is de- debilitating. And as so many people don't want to talk about it, especially dudes, you mm. know. Um, but I'm just kind of like I'm the same age. I'm 42 as well, you know. I'm, I just got to this stage, really, in the last. It's been about six years where I've just gone fuck it like i'm just going to be who i want to be and i'm going to talk about it and um i don't know it seems like losing that fear takes the power out of that anxiety mm. and that that's that's what i've i've noticed just an observation so yeah i think it's really good to just openly talk about it i mean when you when you're ha- in the throes of depression it's very hard to talk about it because you don't <laughs> it does feel shameful and you don't even want someone being aware of it because then you feel like they are pressured to feel sorry for you and that makes you feel worse and it's just this, it's just, it's a horrible cycle. But certainly, so it's, I, I, you know, I know for a fact that it's not easy to talk about it when you're in it, but certainly as a reflection, I don't think you should ever be ashamed of the fact that you've been depressed or you've been had anxiety and I think it's really important to be able to just openly talk about it just as much as you had a coffee yesterday like mm-hmm. because the more awareness of it and the more awareness that it's so prominent um obviously it just allows people to to take it take it for what it, like to, to know it's real and to like has it, has it been a constant in your life you think and just sort of culminated recently uh, d- depression i battled with a lot when i was younger and i went through a lot of stages with it Anx- depression and anxiety are very they're different they're like, it's funny, my, I've got a, a cousin who's very close to me. He's always battled a lot with anxiety and I always battled a lot with depression. And we used to, we call anxiety and depression cousins as well. It's like they're of the same family, but they're, you know, they're related, but they're not the same thing. Mm. Um, so I guess, yeah, and I've, I've battled a lot over the years with where that depression comes from, what it is, and I've gone through all those stages of looking into my history and the things that have upset me and the things that I haven't resolved in myself and tried to work through them and better myself, you know, all that stuff you do, the self-help stuff. And uh, and then I guess I didn't really notice it as much through my 30s. I thought I was better, but I was really just uh, focused on other things and partying a lot and probably just filling my head with all sorts of mad, mad shit and distracting myself. To... Um Turn the noise down. To turn the noise down, yeah. And then more recently, it surged back, and I think that was. Was there a case that trig- anything trigger it or? I think it. I think there's a. It's a combination of a few things, like definitely age. You know, like that whole midlife hitting the forty, oh, hitting forty. Real. I mean, it, it's real. It's real. Like you, you, you want to laugh and you want to th- go. Oh, I won't go through that. Or, but the truth is that mm. man, I, I was just saying this to Ian the other day that like as you're coming up towards that 40, I was really viewing, I couldn't view beyond 40 as still being even alive. It was just this feeling of like, I have to have have achieved so much by then. There was so much weight. And not only have achieved so much, but also I must be a stable, happy, completely whole person by then. And the, the more you didn't feel like that, the more of a failure you felt. And then I think, yeah, I started to get a lot of anxiety over the last sort of year or so. And a lot of that was just about where I'm at and all this kind of stuff. And But it's really my biggest lesson has been in the last little while this year, it hasn't been that long, has really been about what you were talking about before, being empowered by being present. Like stripping away all those distractions and just truly recognizing yourself in the moment and learning to it sounds so cliche but just learning to breathe and truly be present and cliches are cliches for a reason yeah yeah Mm. yeah it's uh, it's funny though i mean there's so many distortions on i find that um spiritual talk and especially just memes these days just fuck any kind of reality up for me like Why? every time i go to some of them are so good oh but it's, oh, no, there's funny ones that are great but like there's just so many cle- like, like cliches serious of, memes yeah, yeah it's like, people that like you know 
put up a, or put meme themselves. You know, they put up a yeah. picture of themselves staring at sunset and put a quote of Buddha up there when all they really want to do is show off their new abs. Like, yeah, like, yeah. yeah, yeah. And so there's all these cliche yeah. quotes out there, but the, that's what I had to do. I had I, I had turned social media off for years, about three years. I've just got back on. Oh it. wow, really? Yeah. And the only reason I've I got back on it for two reasons. One, when we first moved to Bali, it was just I really needed it to communicate to find a place to live for me and my family. Like mm. it just. It's just how the world functions. Like, yeah. And the second one was because I just felt this deep inspiration that I hadn't had for a, a very long time, maybe ever, was to start a podcast. And then it was like, well, I want to I want to share it with as many people as possible. Like, I want to I want to share these discussions around creativity, and I want to share these discussions around personal struggle because there's potential to help others, you know. Mm. And so. That's been my motivation, but I have to be very fucking careful to not get caught up in the ego of it. Yeah. You know, before I know it, I'm starting to put put up pictures of me getting a barrel on a sick wave or something. Like, look <laughs> at me, you know. Um, and I sort of, and then I, I do, I fall into a bit of shame afterwards because that wasn't my motivation, but it's, it's very hard to battle that. It's a funny phenomenon, isn't it? It is, but going back to, you know, what you're talking about, like turning 40 and that, you know, mm. that midlife... I feel like my midlife crisis, <clears throat> I mean, it's probably still happening, but <laughs> it started when I was 35, I think. 35, I had had that moment of like, I don't like how I'm living and I want to change something. Um, and I'd felt it for a long time and that was when I stopped drinking. Was it was it literally how you were living like physically as in the way you, what you were getting up yeah. to and yeah. like how you operated? Yeah, and I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't, I mean, I was just, it was actually... It was not the way I was living. It was it was the way I was living, but also the way I was thinking. And I just become acu- I became acutely aware aware of my sick thinking. Mm. Um, I, I start um, a lot of my thoughts were dark and negative, and critical and um, perverse. You know, I wasn't proud of the thoughts going on in my head, and it mm. was harming those around me, especially the ones I loved. You know, but it was so insidious. I didn't realize. You know, mm. I was so in it. And um, so I, I started just like ticking off things that were serving me in my life and weren't serving me, you know. The first one was alcohol and drugs. So I just was like, it's not serving me anymore. How long have you been off booze? Mate, it'll be almost seven years. Oh, wow. Mm. I didn't realize that. And what I'm finding is um, I'm feeling better and better. Like it wasn't just... Yeah, it's funny actually. Last time I hung out with you, I was here in 2012. I was kind of at the height of a really bad drinking stage in my life. Yeah, because I think I, I was probably drunk the whole time you seen first me. First saw you at Mixed Place. Up, was and it I a was wedding? Probably already drunk. Oh no, we just stayed there. Yeah. All oh, right. Yeah. I remember yeah. You having. And I was beers. just, but I was drinking for the wrong reasons, and I knew right. it. People around me probably didn't know. Um, but I wasn't. I wouldn't say I was like a fall down alcoholic. I like drinking every day. Couldn't get out of bed without a drink. But that's that's almost too obvious at times. It's like when you're like that, everyone knows it, and so you're mm. forced to notice it because everyone's telling you to get out of bed or to get off the ground. When you're not quite that bad and holding down a job, and you're still yeah keeping you, responsibilities. Yeah, it's much easier to not to think you don't have a problem. Mm. Yeah, yeah. So, um, some sort of it's funny, like, I often used to think when I was in my 20s, I was 40, well, life's done, you know. But it's funny, now, my level of optimism is as high as it's ever been. Like, I'm starting to get thoughts of, like, I want to be doing the things I love when I'm 80, and that's my new goal. I'm in for the long game, dude. Yeah, man, that's that's something I've really noticed recently. And it does feel very recent that I've had a, had a, had a turnaround. I've had a few, a few marked things happen in the not so distant, yeah, not not too long ago, that have really transformed the way I've been feeling and thinking. And one of the results of that is that I've gone from really looking at the next period of my life as just deadly, like I was, it freaked me out and I didn't even see it working or continuing. And now I'm now I have this zest of, mate, bring it on like i, I want to be healthy and happy for as long as possible i, I want to achieve i want to live twice as long if not more than what i am now and and keep continuing to create and and build on what i'm doing now i don't want it to fade which is a new a really new feeling 
because it was getting it, it. You can really start to close your mind off to that, like and start you. You literally start shutting yourself down and just through doubt and self sabotage. And self sabotage is a massive one. Mm. Oh man, that was huge for me. But it, also too, like I, the way I see it is like, yeah, if you do look after that health aspect, um, I mean, like what you were saying, like playing a gig must take so much physical energy, obviously, but. I mean, the emotional and mental energy, I kind of feel that you need to be fit for that, yeah. you know? <laughs> like, um, yeah, it's, I think it's probably a little bit more emotionally draining than, than a lot of people realise. Oh, I can imagine. Um, if you, yeah, either way it goes. If it's a, if it's a gig where the sound isn't, is shit and it's frustrating, it's, it's just so overly, exhaustingly frustrating because you can't do what you want to do and you, and you feel like you've, you're being represented badly and you and it's a horrible feeling. Mm. And then if it's a good gig and you f- really feel it, man, the more you feel it and the more the sound is better and you're do- getting into what you're doing, you go into that zone, man, you end up giving it so much of your emotion that you, yeah, you do, you come out of it, you're quite exhausted. Even if it's, even if you turn around at the end of it and you go, I don't even know if anyone really noticed I'm just on the beach playing it. Like, you know, I'm at a beach bar and everyone's just drinking their cocktails. You didn't, you might not have even had their attention the whole time, but you do feel like you've been through a bit of a, whirlwind for sure and like if you if you're still writing songs when you're 80 you know imagine what those songs are going to be like when you've you've done like a 70 year apprenticeship <laughs> you're going to be like this master you, you might produce something that could change the world <laughs> I'm sorry, well, you, you like, really just hope change history oh, who knows like y- yeah you you kind of hope that you ne- it just remains raw <laughs> i think that's the most <laughs> like with all the with all the um great songwriters all my favorite songwriters yeah oh, definitely there's a level that keeps growing and growing and growing but i tell you what the ones that become more too produced the longer they go mm. to me they lose that it like mm. y- you you hope that after all those years they can still put something out that they wrote lying in bed lying down with their guitar on their chest you know mm. Yeah. Well, like, what songs? Like, sorry, sorry to sort of change topic a little bit. But what sort of music do you like to listen to now? Like, do you have any? Who are some artists that you're into? And you don't it's have to be cool, man. You don't have to say <laughs> some. Because, like, <laughs> I'll, I'll open up. I'll tell you what I'm into cool. at the moment. Go, but you go. Okay. So I battle between because I'm not, I'm not, I don't. Well, I should be because I've got this thing called the internet. But I don't generally listen to the radio. Mm-hmm. So I often resort to going back to my old faves. So I'll you know, be listening to 90s music and, yep. and reflecting on stuff. A lot of the new stuff I end up listening to can be very different from what I was born out of musically. And someone that I just recently, and I won't, and I won't try and be cool, is Billie Eilish. Like recently I've just gone, Billie Man. Eilish? Yeah, I she's like a, I Sing mean, she's it. massive. She's gone huge. She like pop? She's like really dark, dark pop. She's like a, it's her and her brother, her brother basically produces her and she sings and, and songwrites as well, but he songwrites and produces and plays piano and different instrumentation. And as a duo, like they've become massive under her name. She's the front woman. Um, she's only like 17 or 18. She's super young. But her lyrics are really poignant. They're really dark and I love fucked up dark shit. Just love it. I love it when it's just, thrown out in the open Why? And, oh man it's just it's more invigorating it's more raw it, it brings out more emotions it's therapeutic it's, not, it's, it's therapeutic yeah it's just i i don't like it when things are covered in cotton candy and easy to feed you know mm. um so yeah like i mean she's a very very much a i mean she's a big teen superstar now so it's almost yeah it's, it's almost like a a dark and twisted a, Brit, a britney spears if she had never been found by record companies and okay. the corporate industries and she'd just been in a bedroom just expressing some dark shit cool man yeah i gotta look her up so sure. yeah it's, she's worth checking out she's mm. got some cool film clips too that's interesting i mean mm-hmm. i've always loved hip-hop um but and i often go back to you know periods of time in my life you know, of music I was into, like, you know, I grew up in the same era as you, like, I remember when Nirvana dropped the Nevermind album, I, m- I remember yeah. when that came out, my friend had a cover of it, and it was a baby, a naked baby chasing yeah. it. Yeah, I mean, that was the, 
And that was one of the most poignant things. Dude, for me too. I just remember going, Are you f- what? And then, um, yeah, and then, so I, I often, I still go back to that and, and that sort of stuff. But then lately, <laughs> oh man, I don't know if I should say this. <laughs> and I'm not saying it. You don't have to be cool, mate. No. <laughs> No, no. My wife was like, hey, we're going to watch this movie with Lady Gaga. It's called A Star Is Born. Oh, mate, I loved it. That's great. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah, fucking kook. Anyway. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> no, anyway, I'm like, oh, okay, chick flick. I'll watch it. I start watching it. I'm like, I really like this. And, yeah. then, and then he died and I'm like tearing up. I'm like, oh my God, <laughs> this is really good. And, like, and then my daughter, she's four and a half. She loves the, the main song in it. And so we have Spotify on and she starts, we, we play that album a lot. And there's this song on it, dude. And for, I just love it. Like, it just like got really good lyrics. It's like, I don't even know what it's called. And it's like, he sort of goes, maybe it's time to let the old always die. die. Yeah. Maybe it's time. And it's just like a really, I think it's a really good song. Like, yeah, it's super popular, but. No, there are some great really tracks on that, well, in that movie, man. Like well the, written. I, I, I could see you doing a cover of that one, actually. <laughs> I, <laughs> well, it became a bit of a joke in this house because... Oh, a star we, is born. Yeah, because we liked it. Like, <laughs> because we all expected it was going to be, you know, as musicians, we're like, oh, what's this, another pop movie about how to be a musician. Mm-hmm. But actually, it's a, it's a, I think it's a great movie. And it, well, and it's it, based on a, an old movie from yeah, the 50s a, or it's something. It's like the fourth remake of it, isn't it? Okay. Um, but it's... It's also a great, I love the representation of the loneliness behind being someone that's in front of huge crowds, like that whole, yeah. it's it's really well filmed in that regard, like, mm. and it um, it also shows the, you know, the battle of depression and anxiety and how you have to recognise it and all that sort of stuff, but on top of that, there's some, <laughs> some great music in it, like when it, the opening scene, I, I'm the same as you, I, I sort of thought, okay, I'll give it a go, and I thought, this is just going to be pop crap had my judgment hat on and the opening song, I was like, oh, okay, this is actually really it's fucking cool. cool. This is a it's cranking really cool. track. <laughs> um, yeah, man. So roll with it. Yeah. yeah. And Lady Gaga, man, she, she killed it in that. Yeah. I thought it was good. Some serious yeah. talent. Yeah. So man, what's next for you? What's next? Stay in Bali. Well, keep, um, keep living the dream. Are, are you living the dream? Let's be honest. Are you living the dream? I guess so. You're a full-time paid musician. I'd be silly to say I'm not in in the regards of when I think about what my dream was 15 years ago, I remember thinking, man, I'd love to live in Bali and play music for a living. And I'm doing that. So so that's awesome. That's amazing. You or I think you're always dreaming bigger than what you what you're living. Which is healthy too, because it keeps you striving and pushing and working and not being lazy. So, I'm certainly not living the dream that I that I'm hoping to live, which is a good thing because I want to keep pushing towards more and more and more and and getting more done with my life. But but I'm certainly finding a a content, happy, peaceful place in what I'm doing. Mm. But that's also, as we said before, that's a lot to do with mindset and um and really being present. But then. It, it works on itself, doesn't it? Like as soon as you are present and enjoying the moment, then it just seems to get better and better. Mm. And I'm really enjoying my musical journey right now. Like I, I absolutely love the, the friends that I, like some of my favourite songwriters and musicians are my best friends, mm. which, I, cool. which I feel so blessed to be in that position, you know. And they're all, we're all hanging out all the time. We're always making new music. And, you know, as soon as we finish this, my Ian's here, we're going to, like, for my birthday, I wanted to just write and record a song. And that's what we're doing. So, so cool. like, that so to good. me is, is, yeah, that to me is living the dream. It's, it's to be able to call up my mate and say, you want to come over and we write and record a song for my birthday? Like, that's, that's just what that's I want to be doing. So cool, so man. That's pretty cool. Yeah. Dude. Um, so, no complaints there. <laughs> Dude, it's epic. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> it's been epic. It's been an epic talk. It's been an hour and 33 minutes. Nice. And um, it's like a gig down at Intercon almost. <laughs> <laughs> so no, no, it's a half gig? a gig, tough gig. I was going to say, how long how long's no, a normal it's three, gig? It's three sets. Three 45 minute sets is the standard. Yeah. Just by yourself. Just a man in yeah. his guitar. And a, and a, and a shitload of loops and effects. Yeah. Dude, like, I love the whole loop thing. It's good fun. Yeah. It looks tricky. It is. Definitely took... It, it definitely takes time to to get you, get your head around, 
and to get used to without uh, when i first started man i had friends in the audience going dude yeah just forget about the leaper mate <laughs> why oh because if you fuck it up it sounds horrible <laughs> so just Horrendous. just to clarify though like when you do a loop so you might start off by like stomping a box and you record that and then you might and then you start playing that stomp, stomp, stomp. And then you'll start recording a guitar riff. Stomp, stomp. Or maybe a bass line. Dum, dum, dum. And then record that. And then just those two things are playing, correct? Yep. And then you might add like a, a back a backing vocal, just like some sort of hum or sound or something. Yeah. It's and then add that. And then, so how many do you add? Like, Oh, I can add up to tw- 20 like I, I doubt i would ever go 20? beyond 20 but what i think sort of sound are you coming i mean up generally with? i'm probably be- just below i'm be- probably up to 20 Ma- that's max that's like what, I'm so, talking what, what sort of sounds are we talking here like um, maybe a bit of a drum a bass a guitar so, so, a vocal a backing there's <clears> five okay so let's just go quick run on what i do i have like the bass drum i do bass and snare is usually one like dung ka dung dung ka dung like I'm doing that with my ha- like hand and gotcha. fingers on the on the guitar body so that's one and then I'll add a add like a hi hat by picking the strings and numbing them so that'll be two and then a rhythm guitar three then bass I'll octave pedal change my guitar to a bass add a bass line four and then I might add start adding tweaky extra sort of ambient sound with like a delay pedal that's got like in there like so that, uh, and, okay. loop that and that gives yep. it a feeling of depth so that's five and then i'll add a vocal loop for the chorus and i might do three harmonies so that's another three and then i might double some of those to give it an extra crowd sort of so i could get up to four or five vocal tracks and harmonies in there to really give a big chorus lift so that's that's already up around 10 or more dude and then yeah you just, okay then you yeah <laughs> sky's the limit yeah sky's the limit really I and mean, with today's loopers you yeah it's incredible their memory and and you don't need a band you don't need a band it's really just selfishly <laughs> financial gain for me isn't it <laughs> it's all about the money it's all about the money <laughs> more money <laughs> well dude Thanks for giving up your time on your birthday, Man, brother. thanks for rocking around. I kind of feel like it was a little bit serendipitous that we did it on your birthday. Yeah, it's cool. Um, <laughs> and, you know, man, like, I just, well, I didn't realise it until we sat down. Um, I don't know, it's just so nice to connect with you again. Yeah, well, when um, you said um, there's a, yeah, it's do weird. the podcast, because like, we haven't had a proper connection since, uh, we've we've seen each other around, but like, no. Even since that whole thing we are talking about before of realising that we knew each other from being kids. When you said you wanted to do the podcast, I was like, well, that's just a good chance for us to have a really good yarn. Like, yeah. Because we haven't caught up properly. No, on, we haven't, man. Yeah. And, and that first time that I was here in 2012, we didn't really catch up because I was wasted the whole time. Yeah, right. Like, I probably was too. We came here for a surf trip and it was flat for two weeks. Ah, right. And we'd get up every morning, check the surf. Oh, it's flat. Just oh uh, yeah, I like do was, remember you saying that. It yeah. was weird, and then I'd be like, "Yeah, let's catch up, Athron." And then I think you came to visit us, and I was wasted. And I seen you again, and I was wasted, and I was just like, just didn't really get to talk to you. But then when you did that twenty-two song thing on Facebook, I was like, "Yeah, I want to. I'd love to have a good chat." Awesome, thanks, brother. I'm glad you shouted man, out, dude. Happy birthday, high yeah. five, brother. Thanks, man. Dude, <laughs> good stuff. Oh man, you're a legend. Thanks for having me. Cool, dude. See ya. Ciao.